watermarks. They can be as small and unobtrusive as you like, or they can be as large and as obnoxious as you like. Where you fall on that scale is entirely up to you, but Darktable has a watermark module that is highly customizable and will allow you to add a watermark to your images. And just how that works is the subject of this video. Let's get into it. Hi, and welcome to episode 40 of Understanding Darktable. Well, like I said, watermarks. You can be as subtle or as obnoxious as you want to be. And so for this, I've just grabbed another image from the shoot that Tegan and I did a week ago now. And what I'm going to start with is I'm going to add a, a very quick frame to this. I actually have a preset called Instagram. And what I've done is created this frame that basically creates a, a square image that I can post all of my images to Instagram and not have to worry about Instagram's silly aspect ratio rules because if I want a tall vertical image, I can export it with this frame and it becomes out as a square image. And if I want to post a wide, thin panorama, I can put this frame on it and it still comes out as a square image. And the reason I've added this is because this gives us somewhere to put our watermark that's actually not over the top of the image. You don't have to do that. You can put it over the image if you want. So how does the watermark module work? Well, when we look at it, you'll see that there's this first entry called marker. And under marker, we have four options, Darktable, Hasselblad, Promo, and Simple Text. Everything after that is user-created watermarks, and we'll get into those in a sec. If we just go with the first one, dark table, what that does is put this watermark right across the middle of your image. It's got the dark table logo. It's got some basic EXIF metadata of shutter speed, aperture, focal length, and ISO. And then it's got the camera that was used and the timestamp. Now, as you will see down the bottom here in the properties section, we have opacity. So as you can imagine, we can fade the opacity of the watermark to any point at which we like. We've got scale, which allows us to resize the watermark to as small or as large as we want it. We've got a rotation control, which will allow us to rotate the watermark to any angle that we need. And remember, with all of these sliders, we can right click and enter a value manually if you want an exact value. Uh, I'll just set that back to zero. And we can scale, that is this second slider, based on the image or the longer border or the shorter border. So with the scale set to 100%, if we set larger border, well, actually, let me undo the frame because that's going to <laughs> change the way this responds. If we go back to this where we have a long border and a short border, and we then activate the dark table watermark. If I set this to larger border, then 100% of the larger border means it will be the same width as the longest border of the image. If I set that to smaller border, then the width of the watermark is the same number of pixels as the shorter border of this image, which is the height. So if I was to rotate this 90 degrees, it would actually go from top edge to bottom edge. Let's just try that. So just right click, go 90 degrees, and there we go. So set that back to zero. And so that is those three scale on options. I generally just leave it on image and I scale manually if I'm actually applying a watermark. Next up, we've got this alignment box, which has nine different positions for where we can place our watermark. Now let's just scale this down a bit. So by default, it's in the very middle of the image. We can go top left, top center, top right, middle left, middle right, bottom left, bottom center, bottom right. Now, obviously you can do what you like with all of that. So I'll just put it back in the middle and you then have an X offset and a Y offset. If you maybe didn't want this to sit right on the le left hand border, you could apply a small positive X offset to 
make it a little further off that border. Likewise, if you'd chosen the right-hand side, you would then choose a negative X offset to bring it a little bit to the left of its default position. Let's just put that back to zero. The same goes with any of the top or bottom settings. You can then use the Y offset to set it either a little bit higher or a little bit lower than its default position. So if we went top middle, a positive Y offset will bring it down from our top edge. Okay, so those are the basic properties of watermarks, but we've only looked at the moment on this first marker, which is the dark table default watermark. The next one is Hasselblad. Now, I'm not entirely sure what the intent here is. I think it's to be a photo frame, but it's only useful if you've already cropped your image to a square aspect ratio because you cannot change the aspect ratio of this black frame. We can change its X offset, we can change its Y offset, but it's always going to be a square frame. Now, if I was to go back to my crop module and actually set this to be a square crop like so and then jump over to here and select the Hasselblad preset I've now got this black metal like frame around my square image but like I said you really do need to have set the image to be a square aspect ratio if you are planning on using this particular watermark because I, I can't understand why you would want to add this to any image that was not square because you'd end up with parts of your image either sticking out the sides if it's a landscape orientation or sticking out above and below if it was a portrait orientation. So let's just jump back to where we were before all of that and now we'll look at the promo preset watermark. This is an odd beast. By default, it comes up on the right-hand edge, even though the alignment is set to center. It comes up on the right-hand edge of the image. It just has this basic text for the dark table URL and the, once again, most basic EXIF metadata of shutter speed, aperture, focal length, and ISO. Where it gets weird is... It's not particularly large, and that's okay. If we want it bigger, we can enter a larger value than 100% simply by right-clicking on the scale value, and we can go up to 500%. But let's just go to 300 for now. And it's completely disappeared off the image. And if I was to introduce a negative X offset all the way to minus one, I can bring it back to where it is now, but I can't get it any further left than that unless I choose an alignment of one of these three left-hand side options, but it still will not go to the left-hand side of the image. If I bring my X offset back, no, it's not coming back. It's just completely disappeared. I don't know where it's gone. I could try setting the scale back to 100%, and it's oh, okay there it goes we can get it to the left hand side its behavior is odd to say the least uh, with left alignment on that should have snapped to the left hand side with the x offset at zero but as you can see it's still over here on the right hand side of the image so it's a it's a strange beast it really is and not very pretty either okay so those are the first three. The fourth one is simple text. Let me just reset the whole watermark module. And now we will go to the simple text option. Now, simple text, we have this third line here that says text. And this is a line that we can actually type in. So I might go, see for a copyright, 2019, Bruce williamsphotography.com 
And as you can see, it scales down the size of the text as you type. And we have a default font, and on Linux, that's Deja Vu Sans Book. We can click on the font name, which brings up this pick a font window. And I can choose any font on my system, and I can change the size of the font down here. Now, I actually don't generally use this font size control simply because you've got that scale slider which will allow you to increase or decrease the size of the whole watermark without having to use the font size control. So click on select and we've got our basic text. Now if we want to change the color we've got a couple of options. One we can use the eyedropper to sample a color from on screen so I might just say this nice light brown of a skin tone, which would make the watermark very difficult to read. That's fine. Turn the eyedropper off and we can click on the color swatch and we can choose any of the preset colors here, or we could also click on the plus button, which brings up our little color matrix here and we can choose any hue and saturation that we like. And again, we can then go through and handle, you know, opacity and scale and rotation and all that sort of stuff, alignment, etc., etc. Okay, so that's the simple text version of a watermark. Next up is for you to create your own watermark using any application which can create and save in SVG format. Now, I'm not going to go into a tutorial on how to do that. I would recommend Inkscape because it's available on Windows, Mac and Linux and it's free to use in perpetuity. If you have created your own watermark in SVG format, what you can do is copy that into this folder on Linux. It's home.config darktable watermarks where you would put those files on Mac and Windows. I'm not 100% certain. If you use either of those operating systems on a daily basis, you can probably work it out for yourself. If not, ask on the Darktable Unofficial group on Facebook or just do a Google search. I'm sure there's information around about where those files need to go for both Mac and Windows. So I've just created something very rough and ready here called bwphanddrawn.svg and to use it I will need to just jump out of the darkroom briefly then I can go back in that will allow the watermark module to refresh I can drop down this menu and here is BWP hand drawn. now before I do that I'm going to re-instigate this frame and then on my watermark module, I will go BWP hand drawn. And it is very rough and ready. Took me about three seconds to do in Inkscape. And what I would do is I would shrink this down to whatever size I wanted. I might go bottom alignment. I don't want it to sit right down there. So I might just bring it up a little bit. And there you go. And you know, how complicated you want to get with your SVG design is entirely up to you, your creativity and your skill set. Okay, if you do know which folders to put those watermarks in for Mac and Windows, please sing out in the comments down below for the benefit of anyone else who might not know how to find those respective folders. Uh, like I said, check out Inkscape. That's probably your best starting point if you do want to create your own watermark. And I think that pretty much does it for this episode. Uh, the only other thing, oh, that other shoot that I was talking about in the last episode that I was going to do with Tegan. Yeah, we've missed the boat. It has got cold here very quickly. Uh, just in the last four or five days, the temperature has really taken a dive and it is too cold now to be walking around waist deep in water and mud so Tegan's up for the shoot but we'll probably have to sit on that idea until October now because today is May 31 it's the last day of autumn tomorrow it's officially winter and uh, yeah it's just not going to be the kind of weather for doing that type of shoot unfortunately so there you go 
what can you do? All right, I think that will do it. Um, sing out with your comments down below, and I will see you in the next one.